This is one of my favorite uh, topics. Uh, I find uh, diagnosing meniscal tears challenging with MR. I, I think it can be, and I'm gonna try to help you understand them and get better at diagnosing these meniscal tears. But we have to start at the beginning. And the beginning that we start at is the general anatomy. This is a beautiful illustration that I had Dr. Beltran make for me about 10 years ago, and I'll tell you why in a moment. You're the femur, you're looking down at the top of the tibia, you're seeing the medial meniscus on your left, the lateral meniscus on your right. And you can appreciate they are not of the same shape. The lateral meniscus more circular, covering more of the lateral tibial plateau than does the more elongated medial meniscus of the medial tibial plateau. You also can see here one of several potential ligaments that could connect the menisci, the best term for this, the anterior transverse meniscal meniscal ligament. You've all seen that, it's a common thing. We had this picture done because 10 years ago, maybe it was 12 years ago, we had a research fellow visit us from Korea, all right? And he came carrying a pile of films because it was hard copy at that point. And he said, you know, I have these 20 cases or 25 cases of proven root ligament tears or avulsions of the menisci. This was 20 or 12 years ago. And I had one word for him. I said, I, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I had absolutely no idea what root ligaments were. We're gonna get into them a little bit later. Well, it's a hot topic now, and Korea has been far ahead of the United States in the diagnosis and treatment of these root ligaments. So I had this made as I tried to understand them, and we did some anatomy work on the root ligaments uh, at, uh, over the next uh, couple of years. And if you look at this diagram, one, two, three, and four are the root ligaments of the menisci one anterior, one posterior for each meniscus. They hold the meniscus in place, all right? You can see those on the medial side are further apart, numbers one and two, than those on the lateral side, numbers three and four, all right? So these are important, and I'm gonna get back to them in a little while when we talk about root ligament injuries. I was a first year medical student in anatomy when I learned that the human meniscus has very little blood supply, very, very useful information. There are two sources of blood to the meniscus, both entering the periphery. The first is a perimeniscal capillary plexus shown by the red squiggly lines in this diagram. And the second is a synovial reflection at the top and bottom of that meniscus and you put it all together and you end up with an outer vascular region and a much wider inner uh, avascular region. Now this has great importance to the orthopedic surgeon because the orthopedic uh, surgeons realize that any tear of the meniscus in the vascular area carries a good prognosis even healing on its own in some cases, where any tear in that inner avascular region will not heal and probably requires meniscal resection. As you know, the orthopedic surgeons have shortened the terminology to include the red and white zones of the meniscus. The red zone, that peripheral reddish area, the white zone far wider, and you can see it here. Now we come along as the imagers, right? And we image this meniscus and using our standard imaging technique, this is what a meniscus looks like. It um, looks like a triangle, primarily of low signal intensity. It has some gray. This, by the way, is not blood vessels. This is collagen, more about that in a moment. So here it is. And we cannot tell the red and white zones apart based on the signal intensity, they look very, very uh, similar. So we do that simply, if it's way out in the periphery, we're gonna say red zone failure. If it's in the inner part, we call it white zone failure of the meniscus. Now at our institution, uh, several of our radiologists are working with ultra short TE sequences, and to give you an idea of what the meniscus looks like utilizing ultra short TE sequences, you can see, yes, there, the red zone is of higher signal than the white zone. So maybe this will be a bit of the future. 
of MR imaging of the menisci, but right now the signal intensity is the same. Let's turn to meniscal morphology, and this is the medial meniscus, the posterior horn, the body, and the anterior horn, and the first thing you need to know is that of the three portions, it is the posterior horn that tends to be the widest of the medial meniscus. So as a quick check, which we all do, I think, when we look at knee MRs, on the sagittal image, the width of the posterior horn, right, should be wider than the width of the anterior horn. And if it isn't, we have a meniscal tear, perhaps with displacement, or importantly, prior meniscal surgery, because that certainly can look the same. So as an aside, the first thing that I do whenever I look at a knee MR without question is to look for signs of prior surgery. I don't rely on the history here. I find it inaccurate or incomplete. So you better know where to look for the signs of prior knee surgery, and they're available to you on the images about 95% of the time. Okay, not all the time, but they're there. But if there's been no surgery, this is what I expect to see scanning the medial meniscus. If I do the same experiment on the lateral side, you see that the three portions are about the same. Statistically, the body of the lateral meniscus is the widest. Always be worried, even if it is pointed, if the body is truncated on the lateral side, not on the medial side. When we look at a sagittal image as a quick reference point, then on the lateral side, the widths of the anterior and posterior horns should be approximately the same. And that's a quick check uh, for us. Once again, I come to the critical slide of this particular talk. And once again, I apologize, it is more complex. But I'll work you through this. So this is the structure, the collagen structure of the meniscus, a beautiful picture taken from the literature. Let's peel away the superficial layers of collagen and we see a highly organized core of tissue with two patterns of collagen. The first pattern are these longitudinal circumferential collagen bundles. They tie together the anterior and posterior horns of the meniscus and I show them as the red tubes at the top. The second are the radial tie fibers, T-I-E, that come in from the outside all the way to the tip of the meniscus. I show an incomplete bundle, the radial tie fibers, here. The longitudinal circumferential fibers are found in the outer half of the meniscus. That's critical to understanding meniscal tears. I'll show you that in a few minutes. All right, they tie together anterior and posterior horns. The radial tie fibers go all the way into the tip. They tie together the central and peripheral portion of the meniscus. That is all you need to know about collagen framework of the meniscus. And if you learn that and understand it, you're gonna understand the three basic patterns of meniscal tear. So here's my representation on a transparent uh, meniscus. You can see it here. These are the longitudinal circumferential fibers, about half of the meniscus. These are the radial tie fibers. And I'm gonna paint the tears as we go through this on this transparent meniscus. There are four mechanisms that lead to failure of the meniscus. I'm only going to discuss the first two of these, compression and shear, because they're the major mechanisms with which we deal. Here comes axial compression. Now, it's a vertical load applied to the superior surface of the meniscus. What it tends to do is to drive the meniscus from the joint. This is called hoop stress, H-O-O-P. Think of it as the spokes of a wheel pushing the meniscus outward. The meniscus stays in place because of the root ligaments and other reasons as well. But the initial tear is a micro tear in the direction of the hoop stress. I want you to watch the slide and see what happens to this radial tear. It encounters a longitudinal circumferential bundle and can no longer go in that direction. So it changes direction, takes the path of least resistance, and ends up as a longitudinal vertical tear 
of the meniscus. Longitudinal, the word means an anteroposterior dimension to the tear. Vertical, the principal direction here is vertical. So the proper term for this is a longitudinal vertical tear. And it is seen almost always in the outer half of the meniscus. If you see something like this in the inner half, it's something else. It is not a longitudinal vertical tear. So let's go ahead and paint one on our transparent meniscus. I'll make it long. It goes through radial tie fibers, right? The, the longer it is, the more radial tie fibers that are disrupted. What do they do? They hold together the central and peripheral portion. So as they are disrupted, the tendency for the central portion to displace inward. A bucket handle tear. So the displaced longitudinal vertical tear is a bucket handle tear of the meniscus. Now some people believe that compression can also produce a meniscal contusion and Clyde has uh, written on this. And I don't have proven cases where arthroscopy has taken place, but theoretically one can have hemorrhage and edema if a meniscus is compressed. And I will make this diagnosis if I know there's been a recent axial load and I see something like this in the meniscus, a lot of signal that doesn't reach the surface of the meniscus. So the ideal circumstances for me is a patient who has a tibial plateau fracture, recent, and right above it in the same compartment on an MR, I see a meniscus with a lot of signal. All right, but none of the cases in which I've called this have gone to arthroscopy. There's no violation at signal of the surface of the meniscus. More about that particular uh, criteria in a few minutes. Shear is the second basic force, and this is more of a parallel force shown by the green arrow. Think of this as accompanying rotational injuries, all right? Two patterns of failure occur with shear. The first is a longitudinal horizontal tear. The second, as we'll discuss in a, in a few minutes, is a radial tear. So the longitudinal horizontal tear, as the meniscus kind of wrinkles at its inner margin or tip, starts at the tip and extends out to the periphery along the path of least resistance between collagen bundles. That's why often it divides the meniscus into two equal parts, a top half and a bottom half. And it can go all the way out to the periphery of the meniscus. Let's draw one and make it long. That has a long AP dimension. And now again, the radial tie fibers are disrupted, making this tear more complex, right? You often get a multi-directional tear or one with a vertical component when dealing with a long longitudinal horizontal tear. Longitudinal, because it has an AP dimension, horizontal, because the principal direction is horizontal. If you have a tall meniscus, shear forces are greater. Think of the discoid meniscus, and a pattern of failure occurs with central cavitation. So we change our criteria a bit in the discoid meniscus, and when we see a lot of internal signal, we wonder about central tearing. And that's often what is found on arthroscopy, all right? Now there's another reason why the discoid meniscus fails this way. The collagen centrally is disorganized within a discoid meniscus. So if it is a tall meniscus, and I think of taller than seven or eight millimeters, I begin to worry when there's a lot of internal signal in the meniscus that we're dealing with cavitation. Shear force also produces a radial tear. Now this is a non-longitudinal tear because the tear itself does not have an antero-posterior dimension. It too begins at the inner margin and it proceeds to the periphery and look what it does. As it, the tear moves out, it disrupts these longitudinal circumferential fibers. Let me show you on our 3D representation. Here's what it looks like in yellow. It looks like the radial tie fibers, and you can see how it is disrupting these bundles. All right, what do those bundles do? 
they tie together the anterior and posterior aspects of the meniscus. So this displaces in a very characteristic way. It opens up like a book and creates an abnormal space. That produces unique MR imaging characteristics, as I'll show you in a few minutes. This is the radial uh, tear. Okay, let's go back to basics. There are two classic criteria we use to diagnose a meniscal tear. One is terrific. One is lousy. All right? The first of these is abnormal meniscal contour. This is a terrific criterion. The normal meniscus is smooth, it has a pointed inner margin, and if it is truncated, if it is irregular, and you can eliminate prior meniscal surgery, then this is a tear, 100%, okay? If it is irregular or truncated. I love this particular uh, finding. That's the one I'm looking for. The second finding, which I don't like, is an abnormality of intrameniscal signal. And you know the rule. If we see signal intermediate or high that contacts a surface of the meniscus, it's a tear. And the surface is the top, the bottom, or the inner margin, but not the periphery. And it was this particular criterion that led to that initial grading system, which the orthopedic surgeons do not particularly want to hear about. They don't want us to grade these uh, things. But you can see the idea. If it reaches the surface at the bottom, a tear. If it doesn't, well, it is not a tear. I don't like this criterion at all, all right? I think this is very difficult to apply. And I'll tell you my own personal story about this. Uh, we started doing MR of the knee in 1985 or 1986. We got our magnet at our university, and I realized we were three years behind two very good bone radiologists up in Los Angeles, okay, Jerry Mink and Andy Deutsch. And they were already doing MR, particularly of the knee, and I felt way behind. And here I am in San Diego. So I decided to go up and spend three days with them sat behind him. I don't like LA, to be honest with you. I'd rather stay in San Diego. But I got in my car and I drove up into their facility and I sat behind them for three days as they read these knee MRs. And during those three long days, they taught me one thing. Now this is critical and you may want to write this down, all right? They taught me sit comfortably. Did you get that? Sit comfortably. Because you see, you don't want to lean forward, press your nose against the computer screen to make that final pixel turn bright. So you can say, in fact, that the tear has reached the meniscal surface. And yet there's a tendency to do it. I see it every single day as I read out with residents and fellows. They'll inch forward, they'll lean forward, and they'll say, see, there's where it contacts the surface. So in my view, it's got to be without question at a distance, all right? And if it isn't, okay, keep in mind that even if it contacts the surface on one image, it may not be a meniscal tear, all right? So when I'm not sure, I'm going to undercall. Or at least I'm going to say, you know, it's not definite at this time. Let's re-image in three months. And now you wonder why I say three months. Well, again, I'll tell you my own story. This was about five uh, years ago, and I developed a lateral meniscal tear, all right? I like to tell you I was rock climbing, but I rolled over in bed. <laughs> and I tore my lateral meniscus. And I went to my orthopedic surgeon, a good friend, and I said, you know, I have a tear of the lateral meniscus, anterior horn. He examined my knee, and he said, you are correct, all right? You have a tear of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And uh, he said, well, let's get a, a, an MR. And I said, I, I don't need an MR. I don't believe in MR. You got the tear. You can tell on the physical exam. He said, you're very lucky because three days from now, we have an opening on our OR schedule. I'll get you in a quick uh, arthroscopy, and you'll be out as good as new. And I said, wait, wait a minute. I've been reading the literature. And a certain percentage of these meniscal tears, the symptoms go away in three months. 
So I'm going to wait. And two and a half months later, my pain went away completely, all right? And I haven't had it. It's a number of years now. It has not come back. So I have absolutely no problem saying, not commonly, but occasionally, you know, it isn't definite at this time. Let's wait three months, re-image if the symptoms persist. I undercall. I do not overcall meniscal tears. Now, if we have a meniscal cyst, I begin to sway toward a meniscal tear, particularly if it is preoperative, okay? Not post-op, but pre-op. Because typically, there's at least central problems within the meniscus. These meniscal cysts don't have to communicate with the joint. Some do. But often, they communicate with the meniscus itself. <clears throat> and you have mucinous and myxoid change to such a degree, it's a little bit like central cavitation. So here I become very critical about any meniscal signal when I have this particular finding. Okay, let's look at these three basic types of tears. You remember them. Here's the longitudinal vertical tear, outer half of the meniscus, all right? That's what it looks like. As it fails further, the path of least resistance shown in this particular image is parallel to the collagen bundles. The length of this tear is its antero-posterior dimension. We try to give it every single time we see this tear. We try to come up with an antero-posterior dimension. If it's greater than nine millimeters, it's often an unstable tear. So that's why it becomes critical, all right? Let's go ahead and image it. And here's a complete one. Complete means top to bottom, okay? So this is a longitudinal vertical tear, top to bottom, peripheral, Half. Now let's stay in the same plane and image it again. And look what happens. In the same plane, it doesn't change. And by that I mean it's the same distance between it and the periphery because it's running parallel to those collagen bundles. So if it isn't, there's some other tear going on, as I'll show you in a moment. That is the classic longitudinal vertical tear. So the image. Sagittal plane, image one. Next image, sagittal plane looks the same. Next image, sagittal plane, and so forth. I majored in mathematics. I add up four images. I know the thickness. I know the spacing. I come up with a length of a longitudinal vertical tear. You can sometimes do that in the axial plane as well, if you see the tear well. So that is a longitudinal vertical tear. Now, these may tilt slightly, and typically the tilt is as I show you here, all right, anterior in the top, more posterior at the bottom, not the opposite usually, and hence they may look horizontal in another imaging plane, but these are longitudinal vertical tears. These may become oblique. Now, you know what that means. Here it is showing as a line, and I think, although this is totally unproven, that if they are oblique, they require high energy. Look at the top right and see what happens. And what happens when you have a longitudinal vertical oblique tear, you will violate some of those bundles, all right? So I think that is a higher energy pattern of failure. So we'll go ahead and image that one. There's what it looks like. Staying in the same plane, now look what happens. It is moving, in this case, away from the periphery. So in my view, when it does that, it's not a simple longitudinal vertical tear. It is a longitudinal vertical blank. And here's what it looks like on an MR examination, a longitudinal vertical oblique tear. The second basic tear is a longitudinal horizontal. As these fail further, here's what they look like. All right, you, just what we said. As they fail further, they kind of open up like a fish mouth, creating a space through which fluid may pass. The length of a longitudinal horizontal tear relates to its antero-posterior dimension. The width is its central peripheral dimension, all right? We go ahead and image one. This one runs from the inner margin to the periphery. These are the tears called cleavage tears that are often associated with these meniscal cysts. Here's an example of one very, very nicely. Cyst, there's the longitudinal horizontal tear. <clears throat> On the medial side, these cysts tend to be larger, more aggressive, travel for further distances than meniscal cysts on the lateral side. 
The two left images showing you a large meniscal cyst violating portions of the medial support structures. The two images on your right show you an interesting phenomenon we've seen several times. This is a meniscal cyst adjacent to the posterior horn of the medial meniscus that is traveling centrally behind the posterior cruciate ligament looking like a ganglion cyst. So before you call it a pericruciate ganglion cyst, consider the possibility you are dealing with a meniscal cyst. Longitudinal horizontal oblique tears violate not the apex, but a margin away from the apex, more often inferior margin than superior margin. So we'll go ahead and image it, and that's what it looks like. This is a longitudinal horizontal oblique tear. The radial tear is the tricky one, all right? Here's what it is. Remember, it starts centrally, goes to the periphery, and note the tear does not have a longitudinal component. That is, it does not have an antero-posterior dimension. It has a central peripheral dimension alone, all right? So the length of a radial tear is its central peripheral dimension, and you can see what it does violating those longitudinal circumferential bundles. So look what happens to these. They open up like this, and they create this abnormal space at the site of failure. So what do they have? They have a meniscal gap. And so part of our uh, data that we put on a report is what the gap is if there's a radial tear with separation at the site of failure. Now, if you image one of these right along the tear, right, you see nothing. That is an absent meniscus. Here's an example. Here's the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. Here, where we expect to see posterior horn, there's fluid, because we are imaging directly along that tear. There's not missing meniscus here. There isn't a piece of the meniscus that went somewhere else. We're imaging the tear. The radial tears show up beautifully on the axial images. So I always, very excitingly, when I've diagnosed these, rush to the axial images to see the radial tear. Here is a long one, all the way from the inner to the outer margin. Here is a similar length one, long one, but look at the gap. The first time I came across one of these, I spent 10 minutes looking for a meniscal fragment. Right? There is no meniscal fragment. This is simply opened up at the site of failure. This is what happens with the radial tear. They cannot be repaired when they're this long. We can use our sagittal images to diagnose a radial tear. As the bow tie unties, normally it does so with sharp inner margins, and if there is a blunted, truncated margin, you have a radial tear. The more sagittal images you see a radial tear on, the more, the longer it is as it goes central to peripheral. If it's only very central, you see this on one sagittal image. If it's got a length that's longer, you're going to see this on multiple sagittal images. Radial tears often become oblique, not in a straight line, but usually in a curved line. That is a parrot beak tear. A displaced radial tear is a parrot beak tear. But I wanted to show this as a straight line just to make the point. Let's go ahead and image this radial oblique uh, tear. Here's what it looks like. On that image, what does it look like? It looks like a longitudinal vertical tear in the wrong place, in the inner half of the meniscus. So if you see lines like that, in the inner half of the meniscus, you're dealing with a radial tear. Either the tear is oblique, or your imaging plane is oblique to the tear itself. Both can create that particular line. Let's stay there, same plane, let's image it again. And you'll note here it marches, either toward or away from the inner margin. This is the marching cleft sign and it is apparent in several circumstances, but it can indicate a radial oblique tear. So here's one. This is a parrot beak tear, okay, and, and that's the tear right here. I drew it, and here are my three images 
the plane, so A, B, and C, and here is a marching cleft as it marches away from the inner margin toward the periphery. That is not a longitudinal vertical tear. Very different prognosis. That is a radial tear. Now we come to a very important radial tear that is critical, all right, that you need to know about. If we look at the normal situation, that's the box at the bottom, Sagittal plane, find the PCL. The next medial image, right next to it, here's PCL, should have a lot of black meniscus. And then the second medial image should have clearly the entire posterior horn. Is that clear? I hope that's clear. Now, look at this case. PCL, not much here. The next one has very little. That is never normal. When you see that, do not be surprised that when you go to the coronal plane, you see this. The normal coronal plane has a meniscus sweeping in, posterior horn becoming a posterior root ligament. Look at this, all right? This is a radial tear with displacement involving the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Not too many years ago, a friend of mine came up to me and he said, you know, uh, we, we really have a high demand for MR, and we're doing a lot of knee MRs. I need to shorten our exam. Can you shorten it to one sequence? And I said, well, I wouldn't recommend it. He said, well, well please help me. Can I shorten it to one sequence? Well, I said, if I had to do that, if I had to shorten it to one sequence, it would be the coronal, fluid-sensitive, fat-suppressed sequence. I love it. Meniscus, ligaments, bone contusions. That's my favorite sequence. And he said, no, you don't understand. We're really busy. Can you shorten it to one image? I said, I wouldn't recommend it. But if I had to shorten it to one image, the most important image on a knee MR, it is the coronal fat suppressed T2 weight image at the back of the medial meniscus right here. If you are not spending 10 seconds looking at that image, you are missing meniscal tears. These are everyday tears, all right? You're also missing root ligament injuries as well. That is the critical image of a knee MR. Because the findings are seen elsewhere, like here, but it is so easy to spot these on the coronal. How many of you are seeing these tears? You must be. Yeah, these are they're every day, all right? This is a common pattern of failure. The word free edge tears means tearing of the inner margin. They can be longitudinal, horizontal, or radial, as we've discussed. They can look similar, but the longitudinal, horizontal tend to have a fuzzy inner margin, and the radial tears, even when small, have a sharp, truncated margin. Well, we have about 10 more minutes, so we'll cover a few more things with regard to the menisci, the root ligaments. Remember these? We talked about these meniscal root ligaments, the two on the medial side, anterior and posterior root ligaments, the two on the lateral, anterior and posterior, and they're kind of pointed out on these uh, uh, images where they are. Now, of all the root ligaments, the critical one is the posterior root ligament of the medial meniscus. It holds the meniscus in place. So you should always look at this posterior root ligament. Now, what it looks like is a tapered structure of black or slightly intermediate signal that extends down and attaches to the tibia intimate with the posterior cruciate ligament. That's what you want to look for, all right? That is the classic normal root ligament. One of the common things we see in older people is enlargement and irregularity of the posterior root ligament shown here. Now this by itself doesn't mean much in that it's not symptomatic, but whenever I see it, I always wonder if the ligament is under more stress and I go back and look at the meniscus one more time, just to be sure there's not a meniscal tear. Here's what a partial avulsion of the root ligament looks like. There's a string of tissue still running down, see it here and on the sagittal, but not much. But the abnormality I want to emphasize is this. 
This is a complete avulsion of the posterior root ligament of the medial meniscus, okay? Because the orthopedic surgeons are learning about these, and some of them are reattaching the ligament to the tibia. Now, this looks very much like the radial tear I showed you a moment ago. There's one subtle difference between the two, and I've learned this based on the study of collagen in the meniscus. That when you look at the collagen of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, part of the collagen is curved like this. So when you have a radial tear, the torn meniscus has a smooth margin. Whenever you see strings attached to that inner margin, it more likely contains part of the root ligament. So here we can see there isn't much root ligament. There are little strings here. This is a complete avulsion. Therefore, the attachment site is gone. So when you image the, the body of that meniscus, this is what you see. You actually see about four or five things. They go together. We have a very beautiful sentence that flows every time we see this on our report. And I'll show you what that sentence is. So we have this problem. We move here, so it's associated with peripheral displacement of the body of the medial meniscus, bowing of the tibial collateral ligament, edema superficial to the tibial collateral ligament, and marrow edema, much more often in the tibia than in the femur. Here it's in both places. That goes together. You see that combination of findings over and over again. And you can imagine with every step that meniscus goes out peripherally. You have stress injury going on in the medial compartment, and you will see this particular combination of findings. And it should not surprise you then that these radial tears of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, okay, or the root ligament avulsions are associated with insufficiency fractures of the weight-bearing portion of the medial femoral condyle, what we used to call SONC, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. Here's an example. Because if you have damage back here, either in the meniscus or in the root ligament, all right, the peripheral displacement and the bowing occurs, the cushion is gone, at least intermittently, and you develop these stress changes. And also, an association with meniscal ossicles. You know, meniscal ossicles can be developmental without, uh, without question. They're present in certain animals in large cats, including lions and tigers, all right? They have meniscal ossicles. But they also can be acquired. And this is an example of what an acquired one looks like. You have a root ligament avulsion, and so you can appreciate here the root ligament is evolved, you end up with this ossification that is present on the plane film. I'm going to finish up in the last three minutes by just showing you images of what are unstable meniscal tears. The orthopedic surgeons define these as a tear in which the meniscus or meniscal fragment is displaced or can be displaced by a probe. Let's be the orthopedic surgeon. Let's do the arthroscopy. We'll do it bloodless. There'll be no blood here, all right? We'll go ahead and we'll put in one scope. We'll go ahead and put in another scope. We see a longitudinal vertical tear. We grab that inner margin, and if we can pull on it and separate that meniscus like that, move it, we have an unstable meniscal tear. So the orthopedic surgeons have criteria for these tears, and we have MR imaging counterparts. The first is a tear that on inspection or probing is greater than nine millimeters in length. So if they can probe it like this, and it is greater than nine millimeters in length, they generally regard it as unstable. Hence, if we have a tear here, a longitudinal vertical tear that is greater than nine millimeters in length, we judge it as unstable. Their second criterion is a tear that on inspection or probing has multiple directions. Here we have a longitudinal vertical tear, but they probe it, and here they see a radial component, multidirectional. So our counterpart, if the MR image shows you tears in more than one direction, here 
longitudinal, horizontal, and radial, typically it is unstable. The third of their criteria, a large radial tear or radial tear with wide separation. So if it runs central to peripheral, as this particular radial tear does, okay, it's unstable. So when we see a radial tear with a wide degree of separation at the site of failure, that is an unstable tear. And finally, a fourth criteria, which is an MR imaging characteristic. If we have fluid at the site of failure, for example, like this, that means there's a large gap, fluid enters that particular gap. The absence of fluid does not prove that it is stable, all right? But the presence of fluid suggests it is unstable. 